Hello everyone, welcome, uh, welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, this is the Fabian Women's Network breakout panel at the Foundation of European Progressive Studies uh, and Fabian Society New Year Conference. Uh, the topic for discussion is the left's agenda for black health and well-being. Uh, my name is Mariana Masters and I'm your chair. This is a hybrid event, so I extend a warm welcome to attendees both in person and online. Uh, to kick off, I hope uh, this will be a, a, a lively discussion. Um, we're joined certainly by a, a, a great panel of women, all inspirational trailblazers. Uh, the format of the event is that all contributors will um, speak in turn and there will be a Q&A. Just pause whilst our last panelist comes to the come to the to the table. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, so we are joined uh, by Sam Moyama, uh, who's the London Assembly member. Uh, Seema Malhotra, MP. Uh, Dr. Chichi Ekator. Uh, Maria Makande, uh, Natalie Greer, and Dr. Sonia Adesara. Uh, so I will go first of all to uh, Seema Malhotra MP, if you'd like to say a few words, just two minutes, if that's okay. Thank you. Yeah, great. Look, thank you. Thank you so much. And I, um, I'm really, really um, delighted to be able to... Um, uh, to uh, to be here today, and I want to just thank you, Mariana, for all that you're doing with uh, with the FWN as well. Look, I just wanted to say um, uh, just a couple of words because um, I think it's so important that we have um, uh, focuses on inequalities and how they're arising that are looking at the different uh, sort of multi-dimensional uh, um, approach uh, to policy. And, um, and to have that not just be um, about, um, uh, about gender, but also to be looking at um, ethnicity. I think we all um, will identify with um, the inequalities that we're seeing in our communities and the fact that I don't think we um, are seeing the Tories um, have anywhere near enough of approach that is looking at uh, race inequalities uh, as well and in health. And I just want to um, just put a, a small frame on this, which is we... Um, we can often t um, look at these um, uh, uh, these debates as um, as uh, like siloed in terms of this being about health, but one of the really important arguments that Rachel Reeves has outlined, and which I think is um, has come through in some of the questions is that having a strong agenda for our public services and for a health agenda is also about an agenda for our economy. And the cost of not doing this um, is a huge one. It's a huge one for families, it's a huge one for individuals, and it's a huge one for our society. The consequence of not dealing um, with these inequalities um, that I think we, um, uh, we're seeing in your we're going to debate, and I, I want to be here for as much as I can um, uh, about this, is that there are consequences for, um, uh, for uh, the economy, as I say, but also for, um, uh, for sharing how we share prosperity. Um, because if you can't work, you can't support your family and you, can't, um, uh, you don't have the resilience that we talk about as well as part of our economic agenda. Um, so, uh, and, and also, for, uh, finally, for levelling up. If we are truly to have a, um, a, an approach to our policy making that is looking at how we build a strong economy, build fairness, um, and, uh, and support people to be able to play their part uh, in society in the way they want to and create opportunities for all. We've also got to see the health agenda and health inequalities as a, as a big part of that. And that's why I think today's debate and what you're doing is going to be a really important part um, of how Labour has to shape its economic policy too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up we have Sem. Uh, you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for being here um, today. Before I, before I start, I just wanted to say I'm really very proud of Mariana for becoming um, the chair of the Fabian Women's Network. <laughs> she, I know she's. For, I was in the second intake of the Fabian Women's Network, and I can see people here who are part of that. But I think we've moved from when seen when you set up FWN to have a space for women. I think having a black woman. Um, really integral to that is really important to me. I'm really proud to, that you're, 
you know, shaping things. But onto the substantive point. So I am a London Assembly member. I represent um, Hackney, Islington and Walden Forest at City Hall. And um, I, I also chair the Housing Committee at City Hall this year. So I want to talk about black health and well-being within the context of not just health. There are people here who are far more learned about those things than I am on this panel, but about just I think the reality that people face um, on the ground. And you know, I think really be happy to share some of the very, very real and live experience that I've had in the last few days with um, the location that I live in, in Hackney, um, in the estate that I live in, and some of the experiences that my neighbors have had. But um, to, to, to really focus on health and well-being, I think um, any future Labour government, um, it's a particularly acute problem here in London, but across the wide the country as a whole, the issue of health and housing is just inter intricately um, mixed, and there is no way to separate those two things. I'm a very passionate housing campaigner, but I also know, meant like many of you, that passion is not enough. We do need to have solutions, so I'm really... Um, keen that in future a Labour government will have some clear, concrete um, steps that they can take um, to resolve some of the underlying issues that impact particularly black people and the, um, the issues of poverty, income inequality, um, life chances, exclusions and so on. Fundamentally, a safe and secure home is so, so important for anybody in order to build their lives and be an equal part of society. And so um, just... Um, just to think about some of those things, I can give you a few examples. We've, been, we've done a lot of scrutinies at City Hall this year since I've um, been chairing. We've looked at a range of topics, and one of the things that I've been really keen to do is to just encourage the people that I work with to talk about and use the word black in the way in which we talk, and to um, when we are putting together panels, for example, to in, invite and encourage black specialists um, to those. And I do think we've had a richer conversation as a part of it. I think I would also add that that's important because um, a solution to this problem can't be found by black people alone. The people up here and the people in the audience who are black and brown can't do all the heavy lifting. It does need to be a whole system approach. And um, I know that at City Hall there are steps and measures that the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, is taking to try and address some of that. Um, I, I want to see the same thing to happen, um, if you like, from the centre, from Keir Starmer's team, and I know that will happen but we need to think about some really, really clear things. So going back to the really boring thing like um, a target for affordable housing, social housing, who are the people on our housing waiting list? We talk about them locally, but who are those people who are waiting 10, 15, 20 years for a permanent home which will give their family security and allow them to then go on to better their career prospects? They are generally black and brown people. They are generally black people. And so um, we need to think about how we invest. We need to, I think, as a party, be comfortable with that conversation and from it figure out what are the solutions to supporting those communities. Um, and I think one other thing I would say is um, there is a lot that, um, as Fabians, we can do. And for people that are not here, that, here that are not Fabians, um, apologies if I just address you as a Fabian. <laughs> but um, there's... Yeah, you should, you should join. Um, <laughs> come one, come all, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But um, what I want to see um, for, um, to improve health and well-being for black people is to, um, across all policy areas, um, whether it's national, whether it's domestic, international, whether it's talking about um, kind of local government, national government, I want us to make sure that we are very, very specific in the way that we talk about not just the issues, but then the interventions. And I think it's absolutely right and proper and very, very possible that we can do that. I know everybody here is willing to be part of that conversation and make those recommendations. Um, and we're looking forward to a Labour government in future where we're able to actually address um, the particularly acute issues around poverty that affect black people in the country. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Next up, we have Mariam Akande. Uh, Mariam is the co-founder and CEO of Autism Voice. Um, Autism Voice is a charity working to enhance the health and well-being of people, uh, children and adults with autism and learning disabilities and their families, mainly from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Uh, Mariam, you have about three minutes. Over to you. That's fine. 
Um, I have to be intentional of saying good afternoon, because if not, I would have just gone straight to the point. So um, we run Autism Voice, and um, in relation to um, what my, my lady friend was saying earlier, in terms of autism, it's, it's a brother, brother, I don't even know how to say it, it's a bigger picture. It is possible for people to say autism is not color specific. It is. It has nothing to do with color. Everybody else um, gets autism. But in terms of looking at it from a black and ethnic minority, these days I call it the global majority and perspective. It's how we, um, my people, I call them, have been neglected so much. And um, in terms of crisis level, when you go down to Mosley, you find a lot of people of ethnic minority backgrounds on the crisis side with mental breakdown, all because through life and the processes of life, through education, they've been given names that are not really what they are. I know it's on both sides, and um, the families don't have knowledge, but from a research we did last year, there is a perspective of doing research that is out there um, of autism. I'm just specifically going on autism. So when, and please forgive my political correctness, when a white person does um, a research, it has got a take, a perspective that's quite different from when a person of color does um, a research. So from our perspective, our parents were all the initiators of saying there's something wrong with my child. But the systems we have um, in this country is, you go to the GP, and um, I was just saying to Dr. Chichi earlier, the GP says, no, they just have challenging behavior, their boys trust their boys because they're black. And that is not the case. They are neurodiverse. And we only get to know after age five when they get to school. It is so bad that um, some of the parents are only being, the children are only being given an hour of a day of school now in England. So think about it, if those parents that um, society says they're poverty, they're benefit scroungers, they don't want to work and all this sort. If they were given, their children are being given the opportunity to be in school, these parents will go on to contribute to the economy. But then if they're not being given the opportunity, it's quite a lot, I'm messing my words because it's too much in my head to talk about. But in terms of um, the Labour government and what they can do from our research and the conclusion to what we did, just accessing education, just accessing support, because the people in authority are white folks. They're sitting there. They're the ones who make the decisions on people of color. It's unfortunate. Fortunate is that's just what it is. That's the representation here. And we have a misunderstanding of communication, authority, what I see fit, what you see fit. I am an immigrant. I speak a language that is second language to the language you're speaking. So you're speaking. I'm not getting you. You're not getting me. I have spoken to a lot of, I spoke to the Welsh Assembly, to Camden Council, and they were like, we don't access, we, they, don't, they don't cooperate with us when we want to reach to them. Because we don't even understand your language in the first place. 40% or 60% of the language you speak in English, I can listen to, I can check my head, but most of the immigrant community do not even comprehend some of the big languages that have been spoken. I call them professional jargons. You speak a professional jargon, I just want to hear the layman's language, black and white of what you want to say, but that's not the case. And in the end, there is a misunderstanding, misconception. So a labor government that would pour money and I know it's, it's, it's black and white to say just put money, no. Give, train GPs, train social workers, train health professionals, give understanding, bring understanding to people. Let there be a proportional representation of the people that you want to support so that we could have um, a better life for these folks who are really, really diehard struggling. I think I've said too much, thank you for this. <laughs> Thank you so much, thank you. Uh, next up we have uh, Dr. Chichi Ekator, uh, who's a GP uh, in London and a GP appraiser for the National Health uh, England. She's a clinical lead for the AT, AT Beacon Project and it's a programme that reaches and engages with vulnerable populations. Uh, the project works closely with the NHS um, and, and other charitable organisations. Um, I have personally witnessed uh, Dr. Chichi uh, um, bringing her a team of clinicians 
uh, to uh, um, areas like to a mosque and engaging with so-called hard to reach communities um, who are not so hard to reach by the way. <laughs> um, and uh, so yes, Ch uh, Chi Chi is part of a health inequalities action group uh, which is a multi-faith initiative uh, led by the Bishop of London. Um, I could go on and on and on, but I'll leave it there. Over to you, Dr. Thank you so much, Councillor Mariana. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you all today. Um, so I've been tasked with answering four questions. So the first is, are health inequalities related to ethnicity? Well, race and ethnicity are drivers of healthcare inequalities. We know that there are forces of structural racism and discrimination, socioeconomic status, as we're hearing this morning, this afternoon, and all the key issues that have become evident since the pandemic, which has just brought these issues into light. So speaking from a, a GP's perspective, I've been a GP um, for the better part of 15 years. I've been a clinician for over 20 years. Um, and it's evident that people from black and minority ethnic groups experience inequalities in health outcomes, um, as well as inequalities in access to services and experience of healthcare services compared to white groups once they're in the system. So for example, Black women in the UK are four times more likely to die in childbirth and pregnancy. There is lots of evidence, there's lots of work by really fantastic groups who have brought this to light. Another example, let's talk about men. Black men are twice as likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer than white men. They're two and a half times more likely to die of the disease and are likely to be diagnosed at a younger age. They may, also be, they, they may also be more likely to face delayed referrals and be offered less aggressive cancer treatments, even though they are more likely to have more aggressive tumours. There is evidence, once again, backing all of this. Secondly, most black and minority ethnic groups are disproportionately affected by socioeconomic deprivation. We've talked about that once again. That is a key determinant to health. As a GP, I'm humbled to say that actually part of what I do in delivering care and looking after people is probably just 10% of health. Yeah. It's about education. It starts from the day a child is born. It's about the house they live in. It's about where they live. It's about all of those factors that we are hearing about this afternoon. So that is a key driver, so a key determinant of health status. Thirdly, the COVID-19 pandemic has taken a disproportionate toll on groups already facing the worst health outcomes, including some black and minority ethnic groups. As a physician, I know most of my colleagues who succumbed to COVID were black and minority ethnic. Now that is a key factor we have to look at. So factors that shape inequality in health, including the forces of structural racism and discrimination, were explored in a report commissioned by King's Fund and published by the NHS Race and Health Observatory to help support the NHS to begin to make impactful changes. We need to start moving towards all the things that were included in those reports. We do know that the picture is complex. There is variation between and within ethnic groups and understanding is limited by lack of good quality data and analysis. So what are the big challenges in the UK in 2023 with respect to black health and wellbeing? Firstly, mistrust. Now, I always say to people that trust is becoming a, a, a huge determinant of health. It's huge in the black communities. Unfortunately, they do not trust the health service. Um, and there is lack of will to make necessary investment in community engagement work with black and minority ethnic communities to develop and deliver culturally competent services. Uh, my, my good friend on my left has talked about that. We need to build sustained and trusting uh, relationships between services and communities, and that's part of the work that I've been doing. Councillor Mariana has seen that in the mosque, in churches, in the barbershop, on a Sunday, on a Saturday. These communities are not hard to reach. They're there. We just need to go where they are. Mm -hmm. Access. Does the healthcare system work for everyone? Healthcare is supposed to be free at the point of access. Now the challenge here, I'm a GP, I know, I see it on both sides, that access is a challenge. The system is collapsing, and therefore, yet again, the most vulnerable will fall prey to the systematic issues first. 
Thirdly, lack of research. I know I might be going over time. But there's an unacceptable lack of will amongst various agencies to direct resources, for example, to make investments to find out why people from ethnic minorities are susceptible to certain diseases, such as prostate cancer, sickle cell. You know, why haven't we moved forward with this? We need to ensure that these groups are uh, receiving the most cutting edge technologies, treatments, and we need to ensure that the healthcare system works for everyone. So what should the Labour Party be promising to address uh, in terms of racial health inequalities as it builds its programme for the 2024 election? Number one, there is an urgent need to build on the work undertaken during the pandemic and urgently address some critical gaps. We've seen the role that faith groups have played in the pandemic. They're doing it for free. You know, we, you cannot underestimate the amount of resources that go into that. We've seen that there is a need for con culturally competent outreach into so-called hard-to-reach communities. That terminology does not exist. These communities can be found in their mosques, in their churches, in their gurdwaras, in barbershops, in food banks, in social supermarkets, on the streets all across the UK. They're there, and I can testify that we are reaching them in their dozens, hundreds, and thousands. Secondly, there is a pressing need for increased investment in community engagement work with black and minority ethnic communities to develop and deliver culturally competent services to build sustained and trusting relationships between services and communities. It is possible. We are doing it in Lambeth. We're doing it in South East London. It works well. There needs to be the will to back a significant increase in culturally competent primary prevention activity that targets risk factors such as obesity, diet, exercise, and smoking. Lastly, there needs to be a concerted effort to improve the quality of ethnicity data and ensure that it is used to identify the specific health needs of black and minority ethnic groups locally and to monitor access to and outcomes of care to support action where it is needed, and therefore tackling the role that structural racism and discrimination play in shaping and reinforcing ethnic health inequalities. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, next we have uh, Natalie Creer. Um, and uh, Natalie is the Director of Liberating Knowledge, a research consultancy that has just launched a report, What It Means to Be Seen, Closing Gaps in Patient Data for Black and South Asian Communities. Natalie is also the Associate Lecturer in Middlesex University uh, on Public Health. So, over to you. Thank you, um, Mariana, and um, you know, thank you for um, inviting me today. Um, so, a lot of it, what I was going to say has been kind of covered, um, but what I, I suppose, reflecting on the work that I, that I do, I think that there is generally a lack of understanding of why inequalities exist. Um, and I think that in particular when we're talking about um, the inequalities experienced by black and other mi racially minoritized groups, is that often people lean quite heavily on genetic and biological explanations for the inequalities. Um, and yes, there is variation, and yes, there are disparities, but we can't, if you ask me the question, do we, should we have confidence in genetic and biological explanations, I would say no. Um, and if we kind of, we need to kind of cast our minds back to, you know, early 20th century research in eugenics, which was specifically designed to reinforce and kind of create an excuse for racism that people from racially minoritized groups were less than, less human. And in some respects, well not in some respects, you know, these kind of ideologies and narratives have continued to persist t today. Um, and so I think these are some of the things that in particular when we're looking at work in genomics and socio-genomics, we need to be very careful that, um, you know, the research that's being done in that space doesn't therefore kind of re kind of create and reinforce um, these ideologies in particular um, and because we see that they are still causing harm um, for black um, and racially minoritized groups um, so we really need to think about how we focus our attention on the social aspects because what a piece of, you know research is showing that you know quite a lot of people do believe in biological explanations. And what this then therefore means is that people feel that the inequalities, whether we're looking at health or um, education or economic 
um, reasons, believe that that's, it's a biological, it's, there's a biological basis. And therefore, that kind of creates a sense of apathy, because what do you do if it's biological? <coughs> there's, it's almost like there's nothing you can really do about it. Um, and that's kind of really dangerous. Um, and not particularly helpful um, as well in terms of moving these things forward. So we really need to think about the social aspects. Um, there is, you know, yes, we need to improve health services, but I would argue that we would need to really focus our energies further upstream. We know that for black and other racially minoritized groups, that actually the inequalities that people are experiencing are due to structural factors. Um, and so what is it that we are doing to focus our attention on those things? If we look at research, a lot of research is focusing on what the individual is doing. You know, what are you eating? You know, are you cycling? You know, these, that's where the focus is, when actually we need to be looking up. And how is it that the, what is it about the way in which services are structured, the way in which policies are designed, that are kind of creating and keeping these structures in place? Um, and I think the other thing you know, was alluded to earlier around the heavy lifting. When we look at work that's being done in the inequality space, actually it's generally black and brown folk who are doing the heavy lifting. We do have support from white allies, but that's generally the case. And that is certainly something that came up through a report that we recently done um, with the Understanding Patient Data Team, um, that again, that was a reflection within the health service that actually it's largely people from minoritized groups who are doing this work. So I think that it's important, yes, that you know, more research is done and that there's better representation in terms of who is doing the research, but I think we also need to become much more sophisticated in how we critique the knowledge that is created um, so that we are able to kind of understand um, how this research that informs our policies, practices, mental models um, is therefore also potentially recreating sort of like the biases that we see within our society. And uh, finally, we have uh, Dr. Sonia Adesara. Uh, she's a medical doctor who specialises in reproductive health. Uh, she's also a campaigner for migrants' rights and gender, inequ gender equality and was former co-chair of the Young Medical Women's International Association over to you. Thank you. God, what a panel to go at the end of. <laughs> Try my best. Um, so I think actually I'm going to start with telling you what happened to a family member of mine. Um, it's the wife of my cousin. She's a black woman um, and she was undergoing uh, cancer treatment and then she started to get really severe pain in her abdomen. So she told the doctors, you know, she kept telling them, she said she just felt that they were ignoring her. Um, and then she became so panicked that she had to call her brother, who's a doctor working in a different part of the country. He arranged for her to get a scan, um, which led to her having to be um, sent in for emergency surgery. Now, she's fine, um, but she, I'm feeling angry now to say, just reiterating that story to you, because how familiar is that story? You know, I can see women you know, nodding their heads, being ignored, being dismissed. Um, and it's, you know, you call me a campaigner. The reason why I'm a campaigner is because I've seen this time and time and time again in healthcare, how misogyny and racism intertwine to harm women, particularly black women, right? And there's, you know, we all know, that we all know these stories, but there is data and there's research to back up these stories. So there was a study done in the US looking at, um, looking at an a &E department and, the, and um, um, it, it, it basically showed that black women were less likely to get to perceive analgesia following a fracture than other women. A study done in any department in London showed that black and Asian women, when they're presenting with chest pain, it took them longer to receive treatment for a heart attack than white women. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, there's different ways in which racial bias manifests in healthcare, you know, whether it's, you know, not learning how sepsis presents in black skin, it's not learning about conditions that disproportionately impact black, um, black communities. But these, these things compound and they have real life consequences. Mm. Um, and look, we, we've talked about, you know, you all know the stats, you know, maternal mortality four times higher, infant mortality 1.7 times higher, miscarriage rates 43% higher amongst black women. And why is that? It's not because what I saw a doctor on social media, right? It's not because black fetuses are genetically inferior or some ridiculous 
nonsense that people, that, that people in the scientific community say, but it's because of multiple factors. It's because you know, black women are more likely to have chronic health conditions that are not being treated properly. And that's the important thing, right? If you've got, if you've got high blood pressure, if you've got diabetes, if these are managed properly by your, health, by your, by your physician, then it won't be harming your pregnancy. Um, gynecological conditions, black women more likely to have undiagnosed fibroids. Again, undiagnosed, that's a crucial point. Why is it undiagnosed? Why? Because they've, what's fibroids? Your symptoms that you present with is pain, it's heavy bleeding, symptoms which women say are being ignored when they go to their doctors and not being investigated properly. And also other factors, like they mentioned, we know, we know that poverty, stress, discrimination, social deprivation are all risk factors for increased rates of for maternal harm and increased rates of miscarriages. Um, and then I'm just, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on, um, there, was a study, there was a study done a couple of years ago now, well not that, it was two years ago, um, and it was one of the biggest studies looking at um, racial inequalities in England, and it showed that if you belong to certain ethnic minority groups, your, 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 it was basically the equivalent of being 20 years older than your actual age. Um, and the factors behind this, you know, we all know this, just multi-layers of discrimination and economic deprivation. Um, and I'm mentioning that because the harm that's done, that, that harm that does, does to people's health, it starts really early. It starts from as soon as you're born. Mm. Um, and look, I don't need to lecture people in this room, but we, know, we all know about the economic situation right now in this country. Um, and we're talking, you know, everyone's mentioned this, but look, Right now, in England, if you're a children in a black household, you're 2.4, 2.5 times more likely to be living in poverty, right? You're, you're four times more likely to be living in, with food insecurity. You're 10 times more likely to be living in a housing with damp um, or mold. You're more likely to be living in areas with higher air pollution. Now, not only does this mean, as a child, you increased risk of infections, increased risk of breathing problems, increased risk of being hospitalized, but it also means 30, 40 years down the line, your health is going to be harmed and you could be dying prematurely as a result, right? So I'm ending on this because I know in this room that there are counsellors, there are campaigners, there are activists, there are people that are working for the party. If we don't intervene now, if we don't intervene now to protect the health of our communities, then not only will these racial inequalities that we've discussed, not only will they persist, but they will deepen and they will widen. And I don't think any of us, any of us can accept that. Uh, it's so powerful, um, and I think uh, the one thing I would say to the Fabians is please give us more than a 45 minute slot yes. next time. <laughs> and not at lunchtime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is, you can, you can see by the, 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 you know, absolutely brilliant contributions that uh, there is awareness, there are solutions that are being proposed, and so really as Fabians I would, I would ask that uh, we are all allies in this journey because actually better health uh, and well-being is actually is correlated with economic prosperity as well. So we all get richer. Um, I'm going to open up to questions and um, I'm going to try and take as many questions as I can. I'm really sorry, but we, we don't have so much time. But I'm going to take the first question from Liz. Uh, second question from Lucy, third question from Shyster, and if you, then I'll, I'll try and take another another round. Um, yes. Um, well, I think you. Oh yeah. Ah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so we've heard quite a lot of, of people saying that you know this is actually really important for our economic prosperity and I think all of you in this room understand that and, and, and agree with you that we have to get on top of this, we have to get on top of the st systemic problems that you were talking about. Um, however, you know, when we talk about the economy, when we measure the economy, we are only measuring it in terms of GDP. GDP which ignores well-being, it ignores the contribution of unpaid care, it ignores environmental factors, um, and it leads to bad policy to pick up on something that Natalie was talking about is that how do we design policy? Well, surely the first step to designing good policy is actually being able to measure our economy, which includes unpaid care, which includes our health, which includes our well-being. So when do we get to ditch GDP as our measurement and put something else in place that can you know, start to address some of these problems? Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Lucy, 
And can, can everybody keep their, their questions as brief as they can? I know that everybody wants to explain. <laughs> Thank you for a brilliant panel and for putting it together, Mariana. Um, there's a word that really bugs me, and it's the word diverse, because it's kind of like diverse from what? What do we mean when we say diverse? And so I think language is really important, and the, the evidence you've given today shows that health justice needs to be central to the Labour Party if we're the, we're the party of equality. So how do we truly put equality central to policy? I just want to start by thanking the excellent panel here for your contributions and more importantly for the work you do day in, day out. So my question is, first of all, is Labour listening to any of you fantastic experts here? And the second one is around um, how do we uh, ensure that racial justice uh, is, you know, at the centre of health justice in this country? Thank you. Brilliant. Now I'm going to move to the panellists and again in the interest of time, just pick on one particular thing. If you haven't got it, anything to say, please don't feel that you have to. But I'm going to start with, with you, Chi-Chi. Thank you so much. And really good points and really good questions. I think we have to start from a position of listening to people, listening to communities, because um, they have voiced their concerns, they have spoken to their GPs, they've spoken to councils, they have spoken to their MPs, they've spoken to councillors. So there is no shortage of feedback. And we need to now put that into action. We need to recognise the contribution um, made by unpaid carers. We need to recognise the contribution made by faith groups. Um, I'm part of the Bishop of London's Health and Equality Action Group. Um, and we've estimated the, the contribution of faith groups to be in their millions and billions in terms of improving health. So it's about listening to what people are saying. Let let's start with that, because when you're not heard, it deepens the crisis, um, and that's a big issue. That's a big issue. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to pick up, Natalie? I would say first we need to know what we're talking about, um, and I think the biggest challenge in the work that I, I, I do, um, well, when, when I worked at Black Thrive, was that actually a lot of people don't actually know what racism is. So if you don't know what it is, and you can't spot it, how are you then going to be equipped to be able to address it? And so I kind of feel like that people should have at least a foundational understanding of what it is and how this shows up in your work, um, because that's how you're then able to develop you know, responses in order to be able to address it. And I kind of feel like, in some respects, people are trying to, they want the solution, the technical response, without having embodied it themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so just, I don't know if maybe it addresses your point and also yours, Lucy. Um, I think you're absolutely right that the term diverse, it's well-intentioned, but has kind of got to a point where it's not particularly useful. And I guess I would say that, and this is just my opinion, I think if the intentions of people are good, then I think we should forgive them um, unfortunate use of language, but we should also tell them what's correct. In, in order to have that conversation about what is racism, because it's not about people being rude and abusive to you on the streets, which very rarely happens, but it is about, um, so my partner, my fiance, I forget to say that, um, <laughs> is, um, is white, and I have now joined his doctor because his GP treats him like he farts rainbows. And <laughs> I had so many problems, really, really basic things, and actually I, I wanted to cry when I met this woman, it was a woman, I was really happy, and she was a, an Asian woman. She understood. She wouldn't ask me things like, when you get a bruise, what color do you go? It's like, don't ask me. You know, it's just, it's an ignorance which needs to be filled and to be addressed. And I think providing the space for people to, to express that ignorance but understand that they want to be educated is really important. I think sometimes us in politics, we can take a position rather than kind of move to the center and find a shared solution. And I think that would be really important. That's what I would want to see. And I think from that would flow that racial justice. But um, I would say also to really quickly to Liz's point, if your basic economic needs are not being met, then the conversations that we have as a party and about how we want to structure the, the economy, if you're somebody who's even struggling to access the benefit system, then you are excluded from that system as a whole. So we're not even talking about black people and their economic well-being if we don't acknowledge the fact that there is a structural problem 
and it's not at the bottom, although most people are in that kind of lower quartile, it's through the system, and what are the things that are stopping people from moving at the same pace as their peers? Sorry? Um, yeah, I think, um, I'm, I don't have time to answer all the questions, but I think just, I guess maybe touching on your question, Shaista, about we need to make sure that this doesn't become a, and what actually Mariani, you mentioned at the start, doesn't become like a cultural war issue, like addressing yeah. racism has real life consequences. And like The Lancet, which is a, um, a global health journal, really respected global health journal, did this, a really brilliant series, the first time ever on racism in healthcare, and the Daily Mail's response was woke nonsense. And I think we need to, like actually this is, this is real, this is real life consequences on, our, on people's health and on the economy. And I think the Labour Party does need to be, be bold in saying actually we are the party of equality and that means addressing racism and racial inequality mm. in the country. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to take, I see a brother, I see a couple of brothers. I'm going to take a couple of questions and then I'm, I'm afraid we are already run over time. So, gentlemen, please be, be uh, brief as you can. Thank you very much. Um, so the question comes from over 15 years experience in the NHS so, and at all levels. So I'm a civil servant right now in the Department of Health. Was at NHS England and was at UCLH Foundation Trust before. And I'm in a couple of advocacy groups and I see a lot of us writing letters to Secretary of State, etc. cetera. Um, and, and, and the thought is about you know, the accountability and governance and particularly our doctors on the panel. Do you think that perhaps we need to look at another route? And I, you know, we used to have health and wellbeing boards where healthcare leaders you know, were, were held to account by people of the public. So, so something like that, where we can actually deliver these points to the chief nursing officer, the chief medical officer, the people at the NHS structures that hold the power that can actually do stuff. Because you know, it is unfortunately at the whim of the ministers at the moment as to whether attention is being paid on these things. And Secretary Javid, whether you like him or not, he was actually involved in this stuff, but now Secretary Barclay is not because of other stuff. But if we had the thing that was devolved from politics and operational focused, perhaps we could you know, address the leaders that actually do stuff on a more consistent basis. Thank you. And the gentleman behind you. And please keep it just one sentence if you can. I will be as brief as I can. Firstly, thank you to all of the panel members. Um, I've, I found this really informative. My name is Johnson Situ um, from Southwark. Um, very briefly, trust absolutely agree, really important issue. Um, I think there's a question for the medical profession in terms of identifying when there's an issue. Um, Dr. Sonia raised this, but I've had a family member who's suffered from SJS, and when they looked at the symptoms, it didn't show up on black skin. So I think that's a really important issue. And then the final thing, there's a question there as well in terms of the next Labour government, how does the next Labour government ensure that the structures are right to be able to deliver the best outcomes in local areas and local communities? Fantastic. Um, I will just ask for two responses and then I will just take a, a closing statement from, from people. So, who, what's the volunteer? Oh, I'd love to speak yeah. into this. Yeah, um, just to pick up on uh, the, the last gentleman's uh, point, um, I think it's about being at the table, taking a seat at the table, um, like a table like this, where I'm speaking to MPs, councillors, and all you learned people. And hopefully you can take this information back to those that you speak to and deliver that information, because um, we can't all be in, in the same place at once. And there is also something about learning from work that's already been done locally, regionally, nationally. So I, um, I run clinics or hubs, we call it, in places like barbershops. So I've got one on a barbershop in Streatham High Road. Um, I'm able to deliver preventative care and health promotion to the clients, to the barbers themselves. They can then spread that information. So it's about learning from good practice and having the will and the resources to support that. So I work closely with Lambeth Public Health and, and various other key partners. It's working. Um, for example, uh, some of my nurses uh, yesterday told me that one of the clients who attends the barber shop um, unfortunately committed suicide. Um, now, a barber is not going to come into my GP surgery for that reason, um, but how do we support these people on the ground? What sort of care do we put around these people who are working zero hour contracts or have house in insecurity or food insecurity? They don't have time to seek services in the same way, but they pay their taxes, they vote. So how do we bring those services to them? Um, I think we, we've said a lot to government, we've said a lot to councillors and MPs, 
GPs. It's there. But let's do things for people that are suffering and don't have time to speak up. So to your question, the, the, the first gentleman who spoke, we just, people like myself and all of these ladies, we just need to be on the table. We need to be given a seat on the table to speak for these communities because they can't speak for themselves. Thank you. I don't think that any of us need to sum up from you. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I think as, as uh, we've noticed other people are coming in for the next session, I will, I will just um, end, end this uh, formally now. Uh, but um, I do want to actually uh, reiterate the fact that this is a subject that uh, does need more of a lens from the Fabians uh, and uh, so I'm hoping that there will be a work program that we can, we can actually add to to carry on this, this, this conversation and this, this debate. Um, so I would like to thank uh, um, Seema who's now had to go off to another, another session, um, who's been very supportive um, and also Sam, uh, Mariama, uh, Dr. Chichi, uh, Natalie and Sonia. Uh, it's been amazing that these women have given their time today and uh, come to really try and, and push the dial. Um, I will also end by saying uh, there are some uh, really engaged women uh, uh, in this room who I don't think are Fabian women. So I would like you to join, uh, uh, go to our website and look up some information. Uh, we are a thriving network of women um, that want to achieve social and political change and to participate in public life. Uh, we have a long-standing link with the Fabian Society and so uh, please do join us. Uh, the jewel in the crown is for us is our mentoring scheme and I think I saw Christine Megson uh, in the room who uh, runs is one of the organizers for a, a great scheme that has uh, now in its 12th year uh, so many alumni are parliamentarians, councillors, leaders of councils uh, in the third sector throughout uh, you know unions you name it we're there well in fact we should be everywhere <laughs> we're taking over um, so yes please do look out uh, there will be uh, uh, the mentoring scheme is in its 12th year and it will the applications will open up I think in next month um, and if you sign up to our details we will we will keep you keep you so again, thank you to the panel and thank you for sparing your lunch hour to come and, and listen and uh, thank you. Well